could she really be here, waiting for me? In my restless dreams, I see that town. Silent Hill. This is a story about a place that inspired the 2006 movie Silent Hill, but where the movie and the fate the people of the town suffered are nothing but gut-wrenching. For Sharky to discover the real-life story behind a similar little place on Earth, and a possible curse haunting it. On the 14th February 1981, when the people of the sleepy little town called Centralia, Pennsylvania, woke up, little did they know that what was about to happen on that day changed the history of their community forever. It was the day that then 12-year-old Todd Dembowski was in his grandmother's garage pottering around on a motorcycle with his 14-year-old cousin, Eric Wolfgang. Through the open gate he saw smoke rising from the backyard. Assuming that someone had thrown out a cigarette there, he went to investigate the job. As he got closer, he lost his footing. A hole opened up where soil once laid beneath him. Todd, not knowing what was going on, fell right into it. The earth and dirt covered his body up to his waist and the more he tried to get out, the deeper the pit got, swallowing more and more of him. The only thing that saved Todd that day was the exposed root of a tree nearby, which he was desperately clinging to life for. For almost a minute he screamed for help. This root brought Eric Wolfgang, Todd's cousin, enough time to reach out and save him from his doom. He freed him from his ordeal by pulling him up by the jacket hood. The biggest and, and scariest incident of all involved a 12-year-old boy by the name of Todd Domboski. I seen smoke, so I went over to see if it was the mine fire, and when I did, I just fell right through. Uh, we were over at Coddington's gas station when Todd Domboski ran over to us. He was covered in mud and he was screaming. And he said, help, 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 my grandmother's uh, yard fell in. Luckily for him, he had like an orange hunting hat on. And his cousin, from what I understand, crawled over on like his, uh, almost on his belly like a snake and, and, and saw the orange hunting hat and just reached in and grabbed him and pulled him in. The danger increases as the fire spreads. On Valentine's Day of 1980, Claire Dombowski experienced a nightmare and a miracle. The ground beneath her son caved in. He escaped death by clinging to a root in the hole. That hole later took tons of material to fill. Everything happened in such a hurry, and I'm rushing around, taking them for oxygen, and out to the hospital, and. Uh, reporters and the excitement of, uh, with the officials around. I really didn't have time to think of it that day, except when I, I'm alone, I think back. Now, it's a year later, I, I run scared and panicked. I almost lost my only child. Uh, it's just horrible. I don't even want to think about it. I don't even like being here right now. I. I want to get out of uh, town. Are you still living here? No, I'm not. I moved to uh, Mont Carmel. That's about three miles away. I just feel a lot safer there. Well, I like it there a lot, but I'm still concerned about my friends and about the other people here that want to leave and can't leave. Um, I still want to help them out as much as I can. The plume of 172 Fahrenheit, or about 78 degrees hot steam billowing from the hole was measured as containing a lethal level of carbon monoxide. A little longer, and Todd would have died of poisoning if he didn't die from burns or the fall into the pit itself. The hole turned out to be 150 feet, 46 meters deep, and 4 feet, 1.2 meters wide. It was incredibly hot, it stank and it sounded like the wind was howling down there. Barely escaping death, Todd stated in an interview afterwards. The smoke was so thick I couldn't see anything he remembers. He was already in there a minute, but it seemed like an hour. But what did this boy do to almost suffer such a cruel early fate? 
Was this the punishment for his sins? What sins could a boy of his age have collected? Did hell really open up for the people of Centralia on that day? This is not that easy. Or maybe it is. Because the fate of this town had nothing to do with the fate of the people of Silent Hill, but with something we already know quite well. The infinite stupidity of people. Let's go back a few years in time. It's 1962 now. Life wasn't perfect, but it was good. Centralia had several churches, shops, schools and a mostly peaceful coexistence for generations now. However, a few problems have accumulated over a while. Or rather, what had accumulated were piles of rubbish. Garbage in several places of the city. All these dumps illegal. To solve this problem, the city decided to collect everything and put it in a single landfill. The designated pit was 300 foot wide and 75 foot long, about 91 meters and 23 meters. And it was made up of a 50 foot deep, 50 meter stripe mine that was cleared in 1935. Unfortunately, it came very close to the northeast corner of Old Fellows Cemetery. Trustees at the cemetery were opposed to the landfill's proximity to the cemetery but recognized the illegal dumping elsewhere as a serious problem and envisioned that the new pit would resolve it. May 27, 1962. A volunteer fire brigade gathered and quickly set the landfill and all the garbage inside on fire. The aim was to take care of both the amount of trash and the stench, planning that only compact ash should remain. And this was the case. When the garbage was reduced to a hundredfold, the local volunteer fire brigade put out the fire again. Water was used to douse the visible flames at night. Proud of the work they had done, they left the scene and immediately got busy with other things in life. Two days later, May 29th, 1962, flames were sighted again and smoke was rising from the pits. The fire was not gone. The firefighters returned there, put out the fire and thought it was finally over. Until it happened again, one week later. June 4th. They approached again with their vehicles and fire hoses. Only this time they decided to call for bulldozers and dig into the ground to discover the true origin of the fire. This procedure took a few more days. What was found turned an already suspected evil into reality. A reality that would rather have remained just a guess. You know, this town was built on the success of work and coal mines. Over the years, more and more mine shafts have been opened to dig up and sell as much anthracite coal as possible. One of these mine channels was right near the bird landfill. Pennsylvania had passed a precautionary law in 1956 to regulate landfill use in strip mines as landfills were known to cause destructive mine fires. The law required a permanent and regular inspection for a community to use such a pit. George Sagittarius, a regional landfill inspector who worked for the Department of Mines and Mineral Industries, short DMMI, became concerned about the pit when he noticed holes in the walls and floor, as such mines often cut through all the mines underneath. Sagittarius informed Joseph Thai, a centred councilman that the pit would require filling with an incombustible material. While searching for a cause of the recurring fire, construction workers found a hole as wide as 15 feet, about 4.5 meters and several feet high in the base of the north wall of the pit. Garbage had concealed the hole and prevented it from being filled with incombustible material, in this case a layer of clay. The burrow, by law, was responsible for installing a fire-resistant clay barrier between each layer of trash in the landfill, but fell behind schedule, leaving the barrier incomplete. It is possible that this led to the mine fire, as it provided a pathway to the labyrinth of old mines underneath the burrow. The gallons of water had no chance against the chain reaction this disaster had led to. Tests concluded that the gases seeping from the large hole in the pit wall and from cracks in the north wall contained carbon monoxide concentrations typical of coal mine fires. The Centralia Council sent a letter to the Lei Whaley Coal Company asking for a solution. 
however stating that the fire was the result of recent unexpected and unusual hot weather conditions, hiding the true origin of the fire because they feared they would most likely end in receiving no help from them. It has been proposed to excavate the cargo to prevent the flames from spreading further. However, the costs of $175 had to be authorized first and, as in any case where money is involved, this must of course be decided for way longer than it actually should, so the situation can worsen in the meantime, as in this case. Until the operation was finally authorized, the fire continued to spread absolutely unrestrained and the underground inferno grew. The new amount of money that was needed now to remove the even larger burning area reached $30,000. $30,000 that made the previous $175 seem like money for a cup of coffee in comparison, while indeed a quite expensive cup of coffee. At the time, state mine inspectors were in the Centralia area mines almost daily to check for lethal levels of carbon monoxide. Lethal levels were found on August 9th, and all Centralia area mines were closed the next day. Even at night now, there's nothing visible, but at one time, you know, a couple years ago when you'd come up here, you could actually see the ground glowing either, you know, red from the fire or sometimes blue. And blue would be from the methane gas burning off. It was, it was kind of wild looking at night, you know, and you see the blue flames coming up out of the hillside. <laughs> I pretty much walk through town almost once a day. And one day, you know, the ground is as you see it. The next day I take a walk through and there's a huge gaping hole in the ground. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. There, there are a couple areas here where, like I said, the fire was so close to the surface that I actually did see, you could see the burning underground. It was just like looking into a furnace. It, it was wild. A lot of them, a lot of brush fires were started by the fire. You can see the trees are, are blackened. Just from it being that close to the surface, it just caught everything on fire. This actually used to be a park here at one time. You can see the evidence of the framework for the swings and all. <laughs> now, that wasn't in my time. That was probably back in my grandfather's time. But, but I mean, it's, it's just amazing to think back, you know, looking at it now and say, you know, 60, 70 years ago was, you know, green and the children played here and all. And you'd never guess looking at it now. And off in the distance, you can see between the trees, another cemetery over there. That's basically where the whole mine fire started, over in that area, across 61. One branch moved in an easterly direction, another branch moved south on the closed portion of 61, and the other part just came west, and that's what's currently burning through this area. We have bituminous coal and we have anthracite coal. And anthracite coal is, as far as anyone knows, the oldest coal on the planet. It's about 300 million years old. And if you think of coal in most parts of the world, it's like a layer cake. If you think of multiple layers and you tilt it and skew it just a little bit, but that's the way coal seems right in most of the world, except in the anthracite region. And there, uh, that coal is literally older than the hills and it follows the topography of the hills. It goes vertically uh, up, vertically down. Sometimes it even goes upside down. And so the anthracite uh, mine fires, they go under the surface and they go deep in a hurry. Now in this part of the United States, we had a lot of heat and pressure, more than anywhere else in the world, compressing out all the impurities in the vegetation and making the anthracite coal the purest coal in the world. 96% of all the anthracite in the United States, and that's three-fourths of the world's supply of anthracite coal, is right here in this small part of Pennsylvania. 
But this anthracite coal, once you do get it burning, it does burn long and hot, okay? And it does continue the burn. That's what fuels the fire. In addition, many illegal mine channels operated back then, which collapsed over time and made further tracing of the fire impossible. Drilling into the ground, however, only allowed more oxygen to get into the shafts, which continued to fuel the fire to become stronger. It was now spreading even faster, making it near impossible to keep up. It also didn't help that the workers were only allowed to work in weekday shifts, eight hours long. At one point, work was even at a standstill for five days during the Labor Day weekend in early September. Too bad the fire didn't care about also taking a few days off. The fire reaching even deeper now combined with the inadequate equipment and work restrictions, the excavation costs greatly increased. After 58,580 cubic yards of earth were excavated, money ran out and the project ended October 29, 1962. Now a new plan was needed and proposed that involved flushing the mine fire. Crushed rock would be mixed with water and pumped into Centralia's mines ahead of the expected fire expansion. But this project also failed due to multiple factors. Centralia experienced an unusual heavy period of snowfall and unseasonably low temperatures during that time. Winter weather caused the water supply lines to freeze. Furthermore, the rock grinding machine froze during a windy blizzard. Both problems inhibited timely mixture and administration of the crushed rock slurry. The Department of Mines and Minerals Industries also worried that the 10,000 cubic yards of flushing material would not be enough to fill the mines, thus preventing the boreholes from filling completely. Partially filled boreholes would provide an escape route for the fire, rendering the project ineffective. News spread about the fire way earlier, but it was only in 1979. Locals became aware of the scale of the problem when a gas station owner, then Mayor John Cardington, inserted a dipstick into one of his underground tanks to check the fuel levels. When he withdrew it, it seemed hot. He lowered a thermometer into the tank on a string and was shocked to discover that the temperature of the gasoline in the tank was 172 Fahrenheit, 77 degrees. Due to risk of explosion, the only tank in service station had to be closed down. The four underground tanks that could hold 9,000 gallons of gasoline were drained and filled with water instead. The structure would remain several more years until John Cunnington and his family could be placed in temporary housing and later permanently relocated. Caddy Corner from where I live, John Coddington operated a service station. He would have problems with gas escaping from his gas tanks. And it was discovered that the reason why the gas was escaping was because the heat of the fire was actually heating up the gasoline, causing it to expand and coming out the overflow. The gas station apparently had been pumping gas at, at 130 degrees or something, uh, an enormous fire hazard. But the problem wasn't just the fire itself. Rather, there was an unseen death that lurked for the residents of Centralia. Remember the carbon monoxide that was found during testings of the cracks in the garbage pit? It was seeping through the pathways the fire created, and townspeople's basements began to fill with carbon monoxide. The city was soon complaining about breathing problems, headaches, and the foul smell. Some even lost consciousness. They established an early warning system in the form of butcher guards. If the bird falls off the cage bar, it becomes dangerous. A few years ago, you could buy a canary at Lou's Barbershop. A bird was a monitor. When it passed out, it meant dangerous gases had entered your home. The canaries have been replaced. Years ago, a lot of people did have in towards this area of town did have carbon monoxide monitors in their homes. They didn't have enough carbon monoxide meters for a period of time, so some of the people had to share them. And you never know when carbon monoxide's gonna spike. 
So you could have it spike in your house and you don't have the meter to know. Some of my neighbors resorted to the old fashioned having canaries in their houses to see if the canaries would die. Generally a carbon monoxide detector over time will tell you that you have an elevated level. And in the case in the Centralia area, those uh, detectors were reading, they were off the scale. They were activated in moments after putting them in those houses. Those houses had such high level of carbon monoxide. Before the incident of Todd Dembowski, people already knew about the fire, which had existed since 1962, but took it all in stride and even joked about it. Now you wouldn't have to worry about cold weather and you could even grow tomatoes in your gardens during the winter. Important government officials were in town at the time of the incident of Dembowski and immediately learned of the real threat posed by the underground fire in the immediate proximity. During the height of the threat, the ground frequently collapsed into holes that spew out scalding clouds of steam and a strong sulfur smell hung in the air. Even the dead cannot rest, wrote Greg Walter for People magazine in 1981. Graves in the town's two cemeteries are believed to have dropped into the abyss of fire that rages below them. Expensive carbon monoxide alarms in homes sounded frequently. Some had to be even shared between households. Surprisingly, citizen concern about Centralia's plight was slow to develop. When Mrs. Oakham and her husband Tom, a state employee, bought their small house on Centralia's Main Street in 1975, they were told that the fires were going the other way. They were misinformed. Today their house is equipped with machines to detect the levels of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and oxygen. Suppose someone isn't protected from the gas and gets a headache. She worries. The natural thing for them to do is take a couple of aspirin and lie down to rest. It could be their last rest. Something similar happened to earlier mentioned former gas owner. The night that my father collapsed, one of the things he, he said was like he was falling asleep in front of the TV and he just thought he was tired. He collapsed and fell out of bed and they went in and they couldn't, they couldn't wake him up. They had to take him to the hospital. Could have died if, if uh, nobody had happened to find him in time, you know. And it was one of a number of scary incidents uh, that had started placing additional pressure on government. Lately, Mrs. Oakham has taken to writing letters to federal government officials. The results, however, have been less than satisfactory. President Carter passed her note to the Bureau of Mines. President Reagan has yet to respond. Finally, she says, I wrote a letter to the Secretary of Health. I got a letter back telling me that I shouldn't let my children sniff the cracks in the floor. Can you beat that? Another angry Centralian is Agnes Owens, a 65-year-old widow. Two years ago, one of Mrs. Owens' sons died of a kidney disease. Another son, also afflicted with the disease, moved to Seattle after doctors told him that his condition was aggravated by the gases in his mother's house. Now, Mrs. Owens herself is planning to flee her hometown. I want to stay, but I'm scared. I'm leaving this fall for good. To keep your sanity, that's what you have to do, she said. If I was offered foreign aid, I'd take it, she added bitterly. My own government isn't helping me much. Despite the inferno below them and the gases that seep into the basement, some Centralians do not want to leave their homes and remain convicted that it's all a plot by coal companies to drive them off valuable land, since the borough owns mineral rights to the coal below. Other rumored villains have variously included anonymous Arabs. and large energy cartels. State, federal and local authorities were unable to dispel the nightmare. The residents did not know whom or what to believe anymore. They began searching for answers. 
Alan Wuma, 52, lives in the heart section of town but doesn't believe that she's in danger and she refuses to install a gas detection machine in her house. We are not afraid of the gases and we are not going to become slaves to a machine, she says. We burn coal for the heat and always have. If we had one of those machines, it would be going off all the time. She and her husband, Carl, informed federal officials that they are not about to leave. I'm not going to let the coal barons win, she vows. Catherine Jurigal, 19, however, is less concerned about mineral rights and coal conspiracies than she is about the fate of her unborn baby. Expecting her second child next month, she learned from a county health official at a recent town meeting that living in her Centralia neighborhood could be dangerous to pregnant women and their babies in the first trimester. Nobody knows what the gas is doing to an unborn child, she says. I guess I'm the test. I feel like a guinea pig. Rats are beginning to appear in town, driven from their lairs by the heat. Some officials have become worried that the fire is now threatening a 6-inch natural gas main that runs under Route 61. A yellow school bus stands ready on a field on the event that an unexpected evacuation of the town is required. We are sitting on a time bar, says Ed Polites, 45, outgoing president of the Centralia Borough Council. What we are afraid of is that it will take someone's death from the fire before we'll get help. Something that almost happened in the case of Todd Dembowski. If he did not hold on to those um, uh, roots, he would have slid down a gangway or down the slope, which was about 300 feet in depth. And if I recall, the temperatures recorded were anywhere from four to 600 degrees at the bottom of the hole. Todd Dombowski's falling into the subsidence, it was such a shocking incident that uh, government could no longer ignore the Centralia mine fire you know, problem. Uh, you know, a 12-year-old boy dropping out of sight into a, a subsidence that was filled with deadly gases. I mean, you can't get any more of a, of a wake-up call than that. I don't know how many times I heard it said that unfortunately somebody was going to have to die before the government would do something about this. And then somebody almost did die. By the early 1980s, cracks were accumulating in the earth and roads were being heaved up by the sheer force of carbon monoxide. Although attempts were made to set up countermeasures to prevent further damage to the roads, such as drilling holes and installing ventilation pipes, this only helped to a limited extent. In the beginning, carbon monoxide was able to escape from it, but the sheer volume of gases ultimately had to work its way through the surface. Later, these holes caused the fire to gain even more power from the addition of oxygen, just like the earlier boreholes did. Since these pipes were very hot from the steam, fences were built around them which added more to the impression that something sinister has taken place here. The fire was moving in kind of an east-west direction, and the highway was kind of a north-south highway. It, uh, it was the main road through Centralia, and it, it cut directly across the path of the mine fire. You had tremendous amounts of steam coming out of the sides of the highway. And when that fog and the steam combined, I mean, if you drove into that, you literally did not know which way was up. It was a very dangerous situation. Eventually, of course, the, 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 the roadway uh, became buckled and you couldn't, you know, it was impassable. They did try a couple times to, uh, you know, pump fly ash or non-combustible material down there, but it just wasn't enough. And so eventually they just closed the highway and rerouted it. In 1984, the cost of putting out the fire was estimated at $660 million. Instead, a legislation was proposed which was approved by Congress, which allocated more than $42 million for relocation efforts, equivalent to $110 million in 2021. Evacuations began. Most of the residents wanted to flee and accepted buyout offers and dispersed far away from the area. 
The rest of the people, however, wanted to stay and continue with their lives in the city they grew up in and their parents before. The people who wanted to move and wanted to move for the safety of their family were almost cast as the bad guys, the demons in the town, by these individuals who didn't want to move. Oh, I got death threats. We became very vocal, and some of the people in town didn't like the fact that we were so vocal. We didn't want someone to die before action was taken on that fire. And, and the potential was there for someone to die. It was very definitely there. Homes began to tilt. Since the foundations of the houses were damaged, more and more buildings had to be demolished, including the earlier mentioned gas station that was already closed down years ago. The row houses that once supported each other, now standing by their own, needed support on the outer walls. Homes of those who refused to leave their belongings here. The first home they ever owned and didn't want to give up. Right on the, this corner here where that that sign is, that was a Connington's gas station. I, I, I mean, I could walk up and down the block and I could basically tell you, you know, all my neighbors, where everyone, where everyone lived. I could tell you everything where it was at, where the, the funeral parlor was at, where the, the bank was at, post office. I could show you every lot and name, name the people, you know. These were all homes in along here too. This was, you know, people's backyards at one time. I'd say probably about three, four homes stood just in this small plot of land. Because most of them were, were such as this, they were half a doubles. This one you'll, you'll see is an interesting feature, these brick columns. Where, where mine is a, is, a, is a duplex and both sides are, are still intact. This one, one neighbor moved away. And back in the late 80s when they thought they were going to leave us here and everything was finished, you know, whoever wanted to stay was, was going to be allowed to stay. And what they did is they undertook a, the government undertook a huge project and actually cut the half doubles directly in half, tore one half down. Behind these brick columns are steel beams, uh, bolted down in, into footings and are used to help support the other half of the house that uh, is existing. Uh, insulation was added, walls were rebuilt, siding added, and the, the brick was basically for aesthetic purposes, just instead of having just steel, you know, pillars and you know, there's so many rumors start. A lot of people think that they are indeed chimneys for the purpose of venting the fumes from underground. <laughs> Dangerous carbon monoxide and what have you. Were those people only going to their beloved hometown, indulging in nostalgia for all the memories they made here? Or were they just fools, risking their lives for mere meaningless earthly possessions? We knew something that had to be done. We knew something uh, had to change. I think there were about 1,100 people living there at the time. Uh, 500 families, I believe, was the figure. And it was getting worse every year. The fire was expanding and there was no chance of getting the fire under control. So uh, uh, working with the state and the administration, uh, uh, we decided that what we'd try to do is buy the town. They basically, they said it was a, an issue of money. All the studies they've done and the research, they, they figured it would be more cost efficient just to move, totally relocate all the people than to find a solution to put the fire out. $42 million was the amount that Congress eventually uh, appropriated and, uh, and that was considerably less than the, the trenching options. Uh, the complete trenching option would have been like $650 million, somewhere in that area. And some of the lesser trenches, they were still talking you know, 100, 200 million, you know, somewhere in there. So they saved a lot of money by relocation. For all those years, it was strictly voluntary. If you wished to move, you could. They would come in, put a valuation on your home, depending on square footage and all, measure it out. Real estate agents were brought in and they'd take comparable values of houses around the similar towns try and determine a value, and then they'd make you an offer, give you reasonable moving expenses and all. But I'll tell you what, when you see some of the homes that some of the people moved out of Centralia, what they moved into, a hell of a lot better than what they had. Yeah, 
as people moved out, as people sold their houses to the, the government, the houses would be torn down. As soon as uh, so many properties are empty, um, they'll issue a contract and, and demolish everything. And they do it in such a way, I mean, there's no visible sign that anyone ever lived there. Everything is backfilled, uh, refuse taken to a local landfill, and there's a very little sign that there was ever a home there. Why do you think they do it that way? I, I couldn't really say. When they start knocking down some of the bigger town landmarks, like the American Legion and things of that, it's, 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 I don't know, it's, it's just like, okay, that's it. Now the town's, town's town really is gone, it's gone, you know? There's no place to go back to. But the government offered us 17,000. We uh, signed our house over in protest. We feel that um, we didn't want to leave Centralia. We did not have any gas problem with our house. Uh, the reason they gave us for having to leave was the fact that uh, there was a mine fire and because there was a possibility of occurrence of subsidence in our yard or our house. But if we did not accept the offer to move, should they take our neighbor on our other side, they would never come back and give us a second chance. In other words, it was a take it or leave it situation. If we didn't accept it the first time, we would be stuck there. And they would take everyone alongside of us and leave us there. And we feel that the government was very unfair with all of us. Data from the 1990 United States Census shows that the nearby towns continue to lose population at the same rate as previous decades, suggesting the Centralians did not locate there. The city was slowly but surely erased from the map, so also as 2002 when the US Postal Service revoked Centralia's zip code 17927. the postal officials decided since there were so few people here they want to completely wipe Centralia off the map and just uh, have us go under the next closest neighboring town of Ashland. We got letters in the mail stating that we could no longer use Centralia on any of our mail and they were basically wiping out our identity. Naturally that didn't set well with me or any of the other townspeople. I was at work in Harrisburg at the time and I, I left early and I came home. I got all the media coverage I could. I had uh, WNEP come down from Scranton Wilkesbury. I, I remember that day the lady delivering the mail from the post office, she was afraid to even come on the street. <laughs> she, she would not drive the vehicle over when she saw, you know, everything that was going on. And With all the publicity, the post office backed down quickly on that idea. And while they still did change our zip code, which in actuality was only one digit, the very last digit was changed, we were still allowed to keep the name of the town intact of Centralia. So I thought that was great. Well, it's just what, you know, where it's always been home and you, I couldn't imagine, you know, changing it. It would, it would be like calling Washington DC something different after all these years. It's just, you know, something you shouldn't, shouldn't try and change. In 2009, Governor Ed Randall began the formal eviction of Centralia residents still refusing to leave the town. By early 2010, only five occupied homes remained, with the residents determined to stay. There were also conspiracy theories floating around. In lawsuits, the remaining residents alleged that they were victims of massive fraud, motivated primarily by interest in what is conservatively estimated at hundreds of millions of dollars of some of the best anthracite coal in the world. 
In July 2012, the last handful of residents in Centralia lost their appeal of a court decision and were ordered again to leave. State and local officials reached an agreement with the seven remaining residents on October 29, 2013, allowing them to live out their lives there, but they were not allowed to pass on their land and houses to their children. Some of them have already passed. Eventually, if they don't die out, they're going to be forced out. That's I really believe that. And I, I hope they go kicking and screaming. I really do. The government promised them that they would not be forced out of their homes. Is what the government said. But I think, you know, government is government and government lies through its teeth. You know, I don't trust government, and I, and I have good reason not to, because for years government lied to us in Centralia. They lied to us. The Centralia mine fire also extended beneath the town of Burnsville, a few miles to the south. The town had to be abandoned and leveled. Although there have been no direct deaths in this story, it is said that some residents have developed cancer from inhaling the toxic gases and died from it over the years. Today, even the ventilation pipes still exist, even though the embers underneath them have long continued their pathway to cause more destruction. They don't emit gas anymore and therefore the metal stop being burning hot. The fences around them have already crumbled. A town that has lost its future was also almost robbed of its past. A time wall that has been set up by the residents in 1966 after that sentential celebration for the town was tried to be dug up by tourists visiting the abandoned Centralia, but the looting attempt was unsuccessful. The avoided loss, however, prompted the people to open the wall two years earlier than planned. Instead of working together, all the wounds were also opened and another dispute ensued between the residents that left Centralia and the ones that stayed that ultimately ended in the refugees winning and opening it in 2014. It was originally buried in the yard of the old building of the Centralia chapter of the American Legion, a veterans organization about 200 feet from the coal mine fire which began in 1962. When they opened the time capsule, they were shocked to find that there was about a foot of water inside. This ruined most of the items within the time capsule and entirely destroyed anything made of paper, such as a Bible, paper documents, and old photos, including one of the 1966 graduation class of St. Ignatius School. However, a few items did survive mostly intact. These included a miner's helmet and a lamp, signed by the man living in the town at the time. A bit of cavity was also trapped in the capsule in the form of the donation from resident Howard Banfield, a large sized pair of ladies' bloomers. I remember him joking about these being his wives, and she promptly smacked him in the head, Ed Lola said, commander of the Centralia American Legion. Everything was carefully dried out. Back then, when burying the capsule, it was of the utmost importance to the town to give those memorable belongings back in the hands of the rightful owners. That intention remained the same, and about 75 former residents and family members gathered at the Legion Hall in Wilburton, a town near Centralia, to watch the ceremony. The opening of the Sentential Vault closes one of the last chapters in the town's history. Even as the pavement cracked and smoked, people came from around the country to leave their mark on the highway in Route 61 that once led to this prosperous town. 
it was destroyed by graffiti sprayers. And in 2020, the owner, a private mining company that purchased the land, decided to get rid of that problem by burying the road underneath a pile of dirt. By that time, it was almost entirely covered in spray paint. A church built in 1911 is the only one still standing, and it is being said that in Centralia lay more dead people buried than there are people living in that town. With already left residents being brought back to their beloved hometown after passing away. You know, it's sad there's just no one really to take care of things anymore. So, and some of the older people I used to, they're no longer around. So I just, you know, try and help out, do whatever I can. Twenty years ago, that that entire section was empty, and I mean, it's just it's amazing, you know think, you know, that's just people's desire, even though they moved out of town, it's still their wish to be brought back here and be buried here in, you know, in their hometown. So they're, and they're still, they're still selling lots and, you know, people are, are still coming back. It might not be nice to, to talk about, but it was always a, a joke with um, our undertaker that used to live in town here and uh, his mother lived there here in Centralia and she'd probably still be here if she was alive. She had no desire to move. But when she passed on, he, he sold the home and because he has his, his own business in Mount Carmel. And he always said, well, people might leave Centralia, but, you know, one day I'm going to bring them back. <laughs> True to life, he does. There is one story left to tell, though. A story that may make you think about all of this differently. Remember the curse I mentioned in the beginning? A curse that connects this town to the town of Sinodil. On a hill overlooking Centralia, Pennsylvania, deep in Pennsylvania's Athracite coal region, sits Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary Ukrainian Catholic Church. A long time ago, there were several other churches. One of them being the St. Ignatius Roman Catholic Church, built in 1869. Attached to that name is a legend that may will make you reconsider everything you have listened to up to this point. A legend worth telling. The first Roman Catholic priest to call Centralia home was Father Daniel Ignatius McDermott. Father McDermott was only 25 years old when he began his work in Centralia and had been ordained a priest only 10 months before this assignment. On the 17th October of 1868, town founder Alexander Ray was murdered while riding in a horse-drawn buggy between Centralia and Mount Carmel, four miles to the west. Suspicion was quickly raised on members of the Molly McGuire's, an Irish Catholic secret society that fought the coal barons of the day for the rights of coal miners. Father McDermott suspected that the killers were members of his congregation and soon began to denounce the Molly McGuire's from the pulpit. In retaliation, on a night in 1869, a group of three men attacked Father McDermott in the church cemetery. The legend continues that after being assaulted, Father McDermott managed to make his way back to the church and rang the church bell to summon the townsfolk. There, he would give a speech that would still reverberate in the heads of the residents for years to come. There would come a day when only St. Ignatius Roman Catholic Church would be left standing in Centralia, cursing the town. He was only partially right. The church closed in June 1995 and was demolished in November 1997 due to the fact that it was directly in the impact zone of the mine fire and posed the danger of carbon monoxide exposure to anyone inside the church. The only church remaining in the immediate area is Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Ukrainian Catholic Church on the hill just outside the northern limits of the borough. Although technically not a Centralia church, some believed that Father McDermott's prophecy simply foretold the wrong church. Further diminishing the accuracy of the story is the fact that the bell McDermott allegedly rang to summon the townsfolk was actually not installed at St. Ignatius until 1874. 
two years after he already left the parish. Even with these inaccuracies, this legend came up in the conversation in the early 1980s as the people of Centralia saw their borough slowly disappearing. Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary was spared the same fate as other buildings in Centralia because a geological survey determined that the church was built on top of rock rather than coal. The hill it stands on gives the church the same overseeing and safe haven like aura as such in the 2006 movie of Silent Hill. What happened to Todd Dabowski? Well, there's only one information I could find out about him. Apparently, he died on the 4th February of 2022 at the age of 53. He told David Dekak, author and former news reporter who covered Centralia in detail, to have had reoccurring nightmares of him riding his bicycle down the street, only for the ground under him to suddenly disappear, finding himself trapped again and fighting for life while being dragged under. An obituary can be found of him on the website of the C.J. Lucas Funeral Home in Altoona, Pennsylvania. He leaves a wife, a daughter and his mother, Florence Kelly. May he find peace in the afterlife. David Dekak wrote this on his Facebook page when he learned of the loss. They administered oxygen. They rushed me to the hospital uh, for some blood gas tests. I was just covered in mud um, from the intense heat. I had heavy pants, heavy shirt, a heavy coat. It was baked on. I mean, you couldn't go to a car wash and blast me off. It was just baked on. My grandmother's house was probably, her yard probably started somewhere right around in here. They had a, a, a big backyard. We had a, uh, uh, like I said, a, a, a shed. And uh, that's where, where it all took place. It's amazing. Nature has taken back its place. There's an eerie calmness despite the fire raging underneath the asphalt and dirt. Trees turned grey from all the ashes. And you wouldn't even think there were precious memories being made every day of the life of its former residents. Memories of grill parties, Christmas celebrations, or just the joy of being able to visit your neighbors that lived in the house next to you. At the end of the story, this isn't a ghost town. There are no curses, nor demons and monsters. No people paying for their sins. There's no torn at all. Will Centralia ever burn out? Probably. But it is considered that it might last another 250 years before all of the existing coal underneath will have burned out. By the time we will all keys out to exist, long before the fire does. But what gives a town its value and makes it worth saving? Is it the people who live there? Maybe it's their memories and the town's history. Perhaps it's the value of the property and the homes built upon this. Unfortunately, in this case of Centralia, Pennsylvania, none of these seem to matter all that much. At one point, at its peak population, there were nearly 2,761 people living in the coal town. Now there are only 15. This is all that remains. But there are more towns like this. Centralia wasn't the only place built on the success of coal mining, and it sure wasn't the only one destroyed by it. But those are stories for another time.
Pennsylvania's mineral riches uh, built this country. The first uh, cannons from the Revolutionary War came from uh, iron ore and limestone in Pennsylvania's mines. We uh, built the uh, railroads, we built the barbed wire that tamed the West, we rebuilt Europe after two world wars, and then uh, industry and the rest of the country sort of moved on and left us with this mess. And it's, uh, Centralia is one part of that tragedy. We know, we know how to start towns. We know how to build a town and lay a town out. And we know something about what to do as towns decline, but we really don't know how to sort of close them up. We don't know what the end of a town is. We can look at boom towns, a lumber town or, or an oil town or, or a gold town in the West, which grew up and had just a couple of years of business and people left and, and the town was gone and the towns collapsed. But these aren't boom towns. These are towns with, with, which have had families and old folks and young folks and schools and churches in it. We don't know how to close them. We don't know when, it, we don't know when a town is over and we don't know what to do. They just, they just sort of linger. Actually, I find it very hard, really, to, to give an accurate description of, 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 of Centralia today. Well, you come up the road from Ashland, and you hit the top of town, and you see this, this, just this vast expanse, except off to the right, there's a, there's a house. In the middle of nowhere, there's a house. Well, it used to be rows of homes, now fields with a, a home here and a home there, or a building here and a building there. The first time I saw it, I was expecting more, I think. I got there and it's just open fields, open land with a couple of houses. I think maybe I expected to see a ghost town. What you see is no town. And uh, until you compare that to the pictures, it's hard to realize what used to be there. Clearly there are still dangers in Centralia. You know, you can see it where the fire is burning, where it's still, it's kind of moving through the town now and out the other end. There could be more subsidences. There could be more Todd Dombowski-like subsidences. Do I think this could have happened to someone else? Absolutely, absolutely. There was no downplaying it. I mean, it's a mindset. I mean, you can, you can, you can live in denial and, and, and think what you want to think, but the smoke is there. The danger is there. And we see these people coming in and they're smelling the smoke coming out of the ground. And stomping else. their foot to see if it's going to give way, you know? You and know, they're you too never damn dumb to realize if it does, they're going down. Yeah. The danger, of course, is that mountain is honeycombed with coal seams. And uh, if that fire somehow finds its way into those other seams, it could continue burning for hundreds of years. And coal is porous, the gases seep through. And so the houses are on top of the coal and those gases are seeping up through the ground and into the houses. I hate to go as far as to call people liars, but <laughs> I guess there's not much, you know, not much else you can do sometimes. I just think they really highly, highly overplayed that, that carbon monoxide issue. Um, I mean, naturally, in the, you know, in the combustion of coal, you know, it is, it is a byproduct, but I don't believe it was coming into as many homes as, as they said it was. I just, I just can't, I can't envision that. I, and now, I mean, no one that lives here in Centralia now has any problems whatsoever with it. What are some of, some of your fondest memories as a kid in Central I'd have to say one of them would be would be Christmas time. The whole town back then used to be decorated. Locust Avenue from the southern end to the northern end and Center Street. They had all you know Christmas decorations on the telephone poles and, and it just it was like it, it would remind it would put you in mind of that movie It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. I mean it was just that kind of atmosphere. It was, it was awesome. Anyone that has adamantly defied 
the unfortunate circumstances that happened in 1980 and will still be here if they're allowed in 2010, you've got to admire that. You, you, you really do. You don't have to agree with it, but you've got to admire that, that fortitude. You know, I always told my grandfather, he said, I'm satisfied to stay here for the rest of my life. And, and that's why, you know, he entrusted the house to me. Um, we did do a, a deed up in the Bloomsburg Courthouse, although they, they told me it wasn't really official since everything was condemned prior to that. But at least we, you know, we, we have that document on file anyway. <laughs> in my viewpoint, it's not a community. Centralia, in my viewpoint, is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It, it was my home for so long. You know, it still is my home, in a way, even though there's nothing there to call home, except my future home in St. In St. Higgies. But, I, you know, it, it is a very sad thing. It's a very sad experience driving through there. When you think of what used to be, and you think of why it is as it is, and you realize the futility of it all, but you can't resurrect the past. You put your foot forward and march. It's the only thing you can do. Right now, to some people, Centralia might look like a living hell. To others, it was and remains home. Beneath it are wealthy deposits of anthracite coal. There are some who claim the government hasn't put out the fire because they want to put out the people first so they can mine the coal. The battle continues. Some fight to preserve their past. Others fight for a better future. Our visit to Centralia doesn't give us any easy answers. It only raises questions. When will the smoke clear? What do I think the future holds for Centralia? If we continue to let the powers that be have their way with Centralia, it means the death of Centralia. It means that in 20 years, maybe, there will be no Centralia.